<coughs> so at the end of my junior year at Boise Bible College, I was walking the parking lot. I was getting ready to go see actually my, my wife graduate that night. And as I was walking through the parking lot, there comes a van screaming in. And these men in suits came out, put a pillowcase over my head, and threw me into the van. Don't you hate it when that happens? While that sounds like a made-up story, it's actually true, but let me give you a few more details. My wedding was the next week, and it was my brother and a few of my friends capturing me for a bachelor party. And I could tell it was one of my friends because no matter what outfit he's wearing, he's always wearing flip-flops. So he was in a full-on suit with flip-flops at the time. I think when he gets married, the required shoe wear will be flip-flops. But we got in the van, and we were all joking around, and, and they could kind of notice that I was a little out of it. I, I seemed tired and a little awkward, and they were trying to get me to joke. And one of my friends, he finally said, Jacob, I can't believe you're getting married next week. And I, I chuckled to myself. I was like, well, this is as good a time as any. You know what's even crazier? I already am. And it got dead silent in the van. And they're like, you already are what? I was like, I'm already married. Because <laughs> what they didn't know was we had gotten back to Boise early that morning, technically. I almost said late the night before. We got to Boise at about 3 a.m., right, babe? Was that about the time? Yeah. Um, because what they didn't know was my father-in-law was in the ICU that week. We weren't sure if he was going to make it, and so Tristan was down visiting him, and she said, I think we need to do a service for my dad. Now, you guys have met Bob. He made a, an amazing recovery since then, but we were not sure if he was going to make it, so we did a little ceremony. I got to call my old youth pastor who did the, who did the ceremony, and I was like, you know that ceremony we're going to do next week? What do you think about doing one tomorrow? And he's like, let's do it. And so uh, I, I love that story. And the reason why I tell it this morning is because my friends could tell there was something different about me. They could tell there was something off because I knew something they didn't. And it wasn't until I shared that they were able to kind of share with the joke. I, they still give me a hard time to that point. They're like, why didn't you tell us this? Um, we're continuing our series in 1 Peter. And since last week, we've reached Peter's address to specific situations and individuals. Peter emphasized that to be a follower of Jesus means that we are foreigners and exiles, basically those who know something a little bit different than those around them, strangers to this world. The way Paul put this is that believers are citizens of heaven. I love that picture. This means that no matter what nation you are born into, as a believer, your allegiance is to the king of heaven before anywhere else. This idea of being foreigners and exiles carries an idea that we are to live as people who know about the kingdom of heaven and to point others to it. Last week, Pastor Andy shared Peter's instruction on how we ought to behave toward authority as citizens of heaven. And next week, he's going to share what Peter has to say to those who are married. Uh, I, I made a joke with Tristan that I said, even though he gave me the text on slaves, I can't complain that I have the hardest text out of the, the text before and after. But today, we're talking about the really easy topic of slaves, and of course, I'm kidding. Before we dive into our text, I, I want to make sure we have a brief recap on what Peter is instructing before this point. Last week, Pastor Andy read these words of Peter from 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, there it is, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Again, we see that Peter leans heavily on the theme of Christians being exiles and foreigners. That they're called to resist sinful desires that live and to live their lives in such a way that people cannot help but give glory to God. <clears throat> Peter is addressing people who are standing out because of their faithful obedience to Christ. The Christian's life is meant to be an undeniable sign of God's glory. 
the idea behind this is that Christians, whatever situation they find themselves in, are called to pursue God's glory over their own comfort or happiness. This is not a popular statement today. In fact, some of you might be saying, so Pastor Andy's coming back next week, right? Your life is at its best when God is at the center of it. This doesn't mean that you will never experience trouble, but it means that he will be with us and provide for us through it. Peter is writing to people who are not only experiencing trouble because life often presents us with trouble, but are also experiencing troubles because of their commitment to Christ. On that note, let's read the first part of our text. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. Okay, let's take a quick stop and address the elephant in the room. By addressing slaves, does the Bible approve of slavery? Again, like I said, an easy topic this morning, right? This is a multifaceted conversation. I just have to express that up front. As I talked to Pastor Andy about this, one of the statements I made was there might be some of us in this room who think we talk too much about some of these topics, and there might be some of us in this room who think we don't talk enough about it. If you are the ones who think we, don't, we talk too much about it, um, bear with us and open your heart for what the Spirit has to say. If you think we don't talk enough about it, we would love to talk to you more about this. You can email me at pastorandy at gmail.com. I'm kidding. That's not even his email. Our contact information is in the bulletin, and we would love to talk with you more about this if you would like to talk more. But as we look at this, we have to acknowledge that we can't look at these words from our perspective of American slavery. There are some slight differences, and I will try to address those very quickly. Okay, the most common way one became a slave in Roman times, there were two main ways. One was by being a prisoner of war. Uh, If you were captured, your your options were either to be killed or to be enslaved. That was the most common way. Another way was by selling yourself into slavery. If you had debts, you could sell yourself to pay off the debt. Or if you needed to basically just get by. Instead of being poor, you could sell yourself into slavery and you inherited the social status of the person you served. Now, this does not mean that there were not corrupt forms of slavery during this time. This does not mean that Roman slavery was perfect. It just was not motivated by race. It was motivated by were you conquered or are you working off a debt, okay? Uh, Another difference is that Roman slavery, you could actually earn or purchase your freedom. Uh, Most slaves, most sources I read, uh, a lot of slaves earned their freedom by their 30s. Uh, This was either by earning enough money to where they could pay for their freedom or their masters releasing them. (coughs) And so uh, actually Peter uses this phrase a little bit earlier in our text. He calls Christians freed men. And that was a term for someone who had their freedom earned or purchased. And we'll explain kind of what Peter is using that for. But here's what I want us to take away from here. What does the Bible have to say about slaves and slavery? The first one is that the New Testament condemns those who capture and enslave people against their will. That comes from 1 Timothy 1.10. The second one here, the New Testament encouraged slaves to pursue freedom if they had opportunity. If they were given that opportunity to pay for or work for their freedom. The third one here, the New Testament warns masters that they will be held accountable by the one who is master over all. So they encourage them to treat their slaves well and with respect. And finally, the very fact that we have texts like ours today that address slaves specifically shows that the church elevated the position of slaves during this time. In Roman times, slaves were objects. They weren't considered people. But the fact that Peter and Paul actually addressed slaves showed that they viewed them as people worthy of the love and grace of Christ, just like their masters. Again, the Bible doesn't condone slavery, but it acknowledges that there are people who have come to Christ, and they're either in the position as someone's slave, 
or the master of someone who's paying off a debt or something similar. If you read the book of Philemon, Paul is addressing a Christian who was a slave owner and encouraging him to take back a slave that ran away. I think it's important for us to read this text from the perspective of Peter's words. I mentioned it before. Live as free people or freed men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Peter uses common slavery language to remind people that while Christ bought their freedom from the slavery of sin, That freedom is not given to pursue relentless wickedness, but rather to live as slaves to God. Again, like I said, maybe some of us want more explanation than that. I would love to talk with you more about it, maybe when my voice is a little more recovered. But that's the background I want to give us this morning as we continue our text. So let's read it in its entirety here. Slaves! In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God." I'm holding you all in suspense right now. You're welcome. Peter acknowledges that there are believers who are slaves, and some of their masters weren't believers. We know that there are some Christian slave owners in this time, again, because of the book of Philemon, but we also know the warning given to Christian slave owners calling them to treat their slaves well because God is the master of them both. But Peter's challenge and encouragement specifically to slaves who are Christians is to submit themselves to their masters out of reverence for God, even if their masters don't seem to deserve it. Not just the kind ones, but the cruel ones also. He says that it's commendable to suffer unjustly because of your submission to God as master. I already mentioned it before. This is not a popular message today, but I want to make it clear. Peter is not saying that we need to go looking for suffering But instead, he says, if or when we find ourselves being mistreated, that we bear it graciously, not lashing out, not seeking revenge, because this will give glory to God. I find it funny that even in Peter's time, he has to clarify that bearing with punishment that you deserve is not glorifying to God. It's not unjust suffering. If you break something and have to pay for repairs, if you're late to work and are docked pay, or if you're fired for stealing something from your work, that is not bearing unjust treatment, but just treatment. Peter's encouragement is to those who are being mistreated for no justifiable reason other than they follow Christ. I think it's important for us to see that while Peter addresses slaves at first, he then broadens the context to anyone who is subjected to unjust suffering. So while the original group being addressed here were people who were household slaves, the heart of Peter's message is for anyone who is mistreated unjustly. I think you can relate to this. Maybe your boss is favorites and you're not on that list. Maybe you've had rumors and lies spread about you regardless of your Christian character. Or we can follow the theme of undeserved treatment beyond the workplace too. Maybe you've been betrayed by friends spouses, or family members. Maybe your kids have turned their backs on you as adults. Maybe people have taken advantage of your generosity. See, you don't have to go searching for suffering in our world because in the course of everyone's life, it will come knocking. Again, cheery sermon today, right? Peter's encouragement to those who experience mistreatment and suffering is to bear it graciously in love to behave well even when suffering. As people who know the truth, who have been saved, who are being changed by the love and grace of Jesus, we are called to stand out even when being mistreated. Now we have to acknowledge that slaves were encouraged to seek legal forms of freedom if given an opportunity. In the same way, we have HR departments today 
We have legal processes for protection. If we find ourselves in dangerous or abusive situations, pursue justice. But even in those situations, we can seek justice while behaving graciously. The call that Peter is giving to those who experience being wronged, even though they don't deserve it, goes against our culture today. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. Today we love revenge stories. If you're not convinced of this, here are some quotes that I think will show this. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die, right? Uh, this is a quote I've used in youth group and I've gotten crickets. So I'm hoping some of us here will get this one a little bit more. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, and the loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Anyone gladiator fans here? Okay, cool. That's good. I got a few, a few yeses, so I'll take it. Or even the simple statement from Batman, I am vengeance. Okay? The, there are countless other stories that we love like these ones that are stories of revenge. While they can be entertaining, we can also begin to follow the thought process that mistreatment doesn't deserve justice, but vengeance. The heart of the world is not about setting things right. It's about getting back. <clears throat> Instead of looking to stories like these, what if we look to the example of faithful followers of God from Scripture? I thought of Joseph in this. Uh, I'm going to try and summarize. Joseph was dad's favorite of 11 brothers at the time. And eventually, his brothers, out of envy and hatred, they sell him into slavery. Now, I know there's some rough sibling relationships in this room, but I hope not to that point. We'll just say that. In fact, one of the things I love, some of them said, let's just kill him. And one of the brothers said, now, guys, after all, he is our brother. Let's just sell him instead. <clears throat> Isn't that brotherly love right there? But he sold into slavery. He eventually is in the, the captain of Pharaoh's guard's house. His name's Potiphar. And it says that Joseph ends up becoming over all of Potiphar's household. Potiphar entrusts him with every job, it says, except for feeding Potiphar himself. And then eventually, when he's alone in the house, Potiphar's wife approaches him and tries to convince him to sleep with her. And when he runs away, she then accuses that he tried to assault her. And so he was thrown in jail. And Joseph, as he's in jail, the chief jailer, he actually trusts Joseph to be over a lot of different uh, responsibilities in the jail. And it said that the chief jailer didn't worry about anything that he trusted Joseph with. And then eventually, he's brought before Pharaoh to interpret a dream. And he's put in charge, second in charge over all of Egypt. <clears throat> now that's a very quick summary of the life of Joseph. Would you say there's some mistreatment in his life? Absolutely. And what I love in his story is that every moment, at the lowest points when he's sold into slavery by his own family, it said, and God was with Joseph. But the sign that God was with Joseph wasn't that Joseph was brought out of slavery. It wasn't that he was given health, wealth, and happiness, but instead he was a blessing. <clears throat> He was a blessing to Potiphar's household. He was a blessing to the chief jailer. And he was a blessing to Egypt. And even through that, his family was saved. But I think it's important for us to realize God being with us in suffering doesn't mean he will save us from it. But we will be a blessing to others through it. I think that's a powerful statement through Joseph's story. Suffering is not a sign of God not being with us or him punishing us. It's a sign of being in a broken world. Peter is saying that even in our suffering, it can be used to point people to Jesus. When we endure mistreatment and suffering graciously, we point people to God. And we trust that he will bring justice in his time. Because we know that he is over all things and that he's coming back. This gives us hope to endure. 
when we acknowledge God as master and Lord. What I love most about this is that Peter also encourages us to look to another faithful example. We're going to continue reading to the end of this chapter. He says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. When we suffer graciously, we model the very heart and character of Christ, who didn't deserve the beatings, the cursings, and the cruelty of the cross, and yet endured it anyway for our sake. Jesus himself gave this encouragement to those who follow him. This comes from Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Or later on he said this, You've heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus' call was not only to love those that are easy to love, but also to love those who hate and persecute us. There's not really a lot of throw pillows with that verse on there. He says that this gracious way of treating those who mistreat us is a mark of being God's children. Because God graciously causes the sun to rise and fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. So when his children show gracious love even to those who mistreat them, we reflect God himself. As those who know the truth that is only found in Jesus, we have the responsibility to model it even when people do not treat us well. Notice the phrase, be perfect as your Father is perfect, which gives us the challenge to love with God's perfect love, not with conditional love. Not just to those we like, but to all. Jesus even says that we are to pray for those who persecute us. Pastor Andy and I talked this last week, and he he said he kind of forgot to mention this or to emphasize this as much as he wanted, And I told him that I was already planning on emphasizing this anyway. Prayer is the key. When it comes to honoring those in authority, submitting to those in authority, praying for them as well, that's the key. When it comes to suffering well, praying for those who cause the suffering is the key. I think of Jesus' prayer for those who were killing and mocking him here. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Please understand I'm not saying this is easy. Like you, I've been hurt by the words of others. I've lost friends because of what I believe. I've been made fun of because of Jesus. I've also failed in responding graciously when I've been mistreated. I've said harsh things in heated moments, responded to someone else's anger with my own, and I felt justified in doing so. This is not easy, but it's necessary. As citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we're called to live according to heaven's justice system. One where we respond in love, even when hated, because we trust that God is our defender and judge. He will set all things right. One pastor said it this way, and I thought it was appropriate, just like a glow stick. Anyone, anyone here use a glow stick before, right? What do you have to do in order to get it to glow? You have to break it. 
And it's not until it's broken that it shines its brightest. Just like that, we also have opportunity to display Christ when we are mistreated. To say we follow Christ means we're seeking to become like him in every way. That also includes in how he suffered. Jesus told his followers not to be surprised if they're hated because he also was hated. While we might not want to emulate him in this way, it's necessary for our transformation into who he wants us to be. I think Peter is the best person to give us this message because I think of when Jesus warned his disciples. He says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'll be arrested. I'll be beaten. I'll be killed. Peter goes up to Jesus. He's like, Jesus, come here. Don't say that. He <laughs> says, that's wrong. He actually tries to correct Jesus. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because you are not focused on God's desires, but on man's. Jesus was telling his disciples that it was necessary for him to suffer and die. <coughs> but Peter had the heart of the world, not the heart of God when he tried to correct him. One early church father commented on our text with these words, and I, I thought he put it very well. He said this, The duty that our Savior here imposes on us in few terms is this, that we be ready not only to do, but to suffer what we can for the glory of God and the furtherance of the gospel. We may assure ourselves he requires no more of us than what himself has undergone before, so that we can suffer nothing for him but what he has suffered before for us. Have we grief and trouble in our hearts? So had he. Have we pains and tortures in our bodies? So had he. Are we derided and scoffed at? So was he. Are we arraigned and condemned? Yea, do we suffer death itself? It was no more than what our Lord and Master had done before. Peter's saying that when we suffer and respond graciously in love, God will not waste that suffering. It's not easy, and he doesn't take pleasure in your suffering, but he's with you in the midst of it. He's growing you through it, and he's using it to lead others to him as well. What is Peter's comfort to those who find themselves in suffering and being mistreated by those over them and those around them? He tells them that they are in good company because Jesus suffered unjustly for us. His reminder to us when we are mistreated is that we worship a Savior who suffered for us. It's at this point, uh, if you've got communion near you, I'd like us to take it. Peter, in this text, he quotes Isaiah 53. I'm going to read through that, and then we're going to take communion together here. This is what Isaiah 53 says. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of the gr dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed." We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished." He was assigned a grave with the wicked with, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him 
and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. With that, let's take the bread together. As we remember, not only the body that was beaten, but the blood that was shed, let's take the juice as well. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much. You didn't have to suffer. You didn't deserve mistreatment. We did. But we thank you that you took that for us. To save us. To free us. But along with that salvation, there comes a responsibility to point others to you even when we suffer because we serve you, our suffering Savior. Jesus, we thank you for the comfort that even when we are mistreated, you were mistreated first. You understand. You care. And you are with us. If there's anyone here this morning who's weary, who's hurting, who's tired and worn out from being mistreated for no good reason. I just pray that they remember your suffering for their sake and that they can respond with the grace of our Savior. I pray this all in your name. Amen. As we close out this morning, I wanted to read one more text This is more of a challenge to us as we go out. This comes from Romans 12, 17 through 21. This is Paul's challenge to the Roman church. He says this, Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You guys are dismissed.